Our featured speaker today is Bill Gatheridge. Bill has over 27 years of experience with Yokogawa in the area of precision electrical power measurements. Bill's retired now and is serving as a consultant to Yokogawa. During his employment at Yokogawa, he was a product manager responsible for the power measurement product line, as well as other measuring instruments. He presented both live and WebEx seminars on various power measurement topics and applications for over 15 years. While at Yokogawa, Bill was also a member and vice chairman of the ASME PTC 19.6 Committee on Electrical Power Measurements for Utility Power Plant Performance Testing. Bill was also a member of the RTCA DO160 Committee for Aircraft Power Testing, and he worked with the ASHRAE Committee on Variable Speed Drive Testing. Bill has a degree in electrical engineering from Purdue University. Without further ado, I would like to turn the presentation over to Bill Gatheridge. Okay, thank you, Kristen, and welcome everyone. Um, our topic today, of course, is on uh, motor and drive testing. Just a little bit about Yokogawa before we get started. Uh, the company was founded in 1915, and they were the first to produce and sell electric meters in Japan. The North American Operations was founded in 1957. Today our worldwide sales are in excess of $3.78 billion. We have 84 companies worldwide, uh, over 18,000 employees, and we have operations in 59 countries. Now you can see we've come a long way from, uh, this is a 1930s vintage standard AC voltmeter. It was a moving coil. Uh, type of uh, uh, measurement with the moving coil and the pointer and the mirrored scale out here. And the real fine wood case, a lot of work went into that, uh, you know, just that wood case. But a lot of difference between that uh, and our precision power analyzers like this top of the line uh, WT3000E, which is one of the most accurate power analyzers in the market today. We're coming to you today from our facilities in Noonan, Georgia. Where's Noonan, Georgia? Well, we're just uh, south and west a little bit of Atlanta. So today's topic again was electric motors and variable speed drive testing, and we're going to be using uh, you know the variable uh, speed drives with the power analyzers. So our, our objective is to give you a three-step process for a complete electrical test of an AC motor and variable speed drive. So we're going to give you the three steps of the input, the output, the motor, the load, and look at each one of those functions for you. We're going to start by just a review of electrical power measurements. Some of you may have been to some, uh, some of our webinars in the past where we got into a lot of detail on electrical power measurements. We're going to give you a review of that. Then we'll look at the mechanical power measurements. Some instrument considerations and a very important uh, subject is the current sensors used for these measurements. Then we'll look at the three-phase AC motor power measurements. Three-phase three-wire. And we'll look at mechanical power measurements. Speed and torque sensors, uh, motor efficiency measurements. Next we'll get into the PWM, Pulse Width Modulated Motor Drive Measurements, Input and Output, uh, Electrical Measurements, the Drive Power Loss and Efficiency Measurements, and some other typical drive measurements. Then we'll kind of put it all together and look at the motor and drive system put together and look at the total system measurement and efficiency and look a little bit at the IEEE Standard 112 which is uh, the standard that we use here in, in the U.S. for our motor testing. Hopefully we'll answer your questions uh, as we go along. If not, make sure you send us an email on your question. So we'll get into with a review of our basic electrical power measurements. I like to start with uh, Ohm's Law. Uh, very simple. Uh, the power measurement for DC, but uh, this is where we start everything and everything comes off of Ohm's Law. As, uh, for power, simplest form, volts times amps. 
Some other functions that we will use in our motor and drive testing uh, as it relates to sine waves is the average responding type meter. This is like uh, using some of the moving coil meters or some of the electronic meters may be average uh, responding. And they have a scale factor uh, to get to RMS of 1.11. So we'll be using this to our advantage a little bit later. If we look at the uh, input to one of our power meters, the RMS voltage was set up uh, off of this uh, source of 120 volts. This is the mean average scaled to RMS. So basically 120. This is that average or mean value, uh, 108.107. And I put the cursors here so you can see where those line up on our sine wave. So uh, the top one here is the RMS value of 120. The second one down is the 108, which is the average or mean value. Now, of course, we've got our peak on the sine wave. So we'll get on with our electrical power measurements. What's a watt? Well, a unit of power equal to one joule of energy per second. But in simpler terms, for a DC source, came back from Ohm's Law, a watt is simply volts times amps. Now for our AC source, it's going to be volts times amps times power factor. Now you'll note I say power factor, not cosine of theta, because we can't always get a cosine of the angle uh, if we have some distorted waveforms. So our active power, symbol P, is the RMS voltage times the RMS current times the power factor. This can also be referred to as true power or real power. Uh, somebody may come to you and say, I need a true power measurement or a real power measurement of that motor. Well, this is the active power. The other is the apparent power with the symbol S, and that's simply volt amps, RMS voltage times the RMS current. In our power analyzers, uh, we use a digitizing technique to convert the analog signals to a digital form. Uh, in our higher end, just about all of our analyzers now, we're using digital signal processing then uh, to get the actual measured values. A lot of our oscilloscopes make power measurements, and they use a special firmware to make the true power measurements. I say digitizing instruments are somewhat restricted because it is sampled data. So we're taking samples, we're taking them real fast, but it is a sample data, so it is somewhat restricted. A lot of our power analyzers and power scopes uh, use a fast Fourier transform, the FFT algorithm, uh, to do additional power and harmonic analysis functions. So, Going back to our uh, analyzer, the power analyzer, and the digital scope, the algorithm that we use is the instantaneous voltage multiplied times the instantaneous current, and then integrated over a time period. So here's our power measurement, and then we talk about RMS, the root mean squared. Okay, so we take the instantaneous value of either voltage or current. We integrate those and uh, accumulate them over a time period, multiply 1 over t and take the square root. Now these calculations will give you the true power measurement and the true RMS measurement on any type of a waveform. It will include all the harmonic content up to the bandwidth of the instrument. So let's look at a power measurement. Let's take your single phase motor. This is going to be a motor load. We're going to put the watt meter in line, measure current in series, and the voltage line to line. Now it's important, you'll see I have polarity marks. So follow whatever type of meter that you're using. Be sure and follow your uh, wiring diagram from the manual because even though it is instantaneous uh, AC, polarity is still very important. 
so we get the right phase relationship. So now the voltage and current that are de uh, detected by the wattmeter, those are the actual voltage to current applied to the load. And the wattmeter is going to give us the power that's being dissipated by that load. Let's look at some measurements with a wattmeter. Uh, we had 120.02 volts RMS, this is RMS voltage. And RMS current, just a little over one amp. The power was uh, 96.02 watts. Okay. And the power factor, symbol lambda. Okay, so this is the international symbol we use now for power factor, is 0.7998. If we look at the VA, volts times amps, 120.06, multiply that by the power factor. If you got calculated, you want to check that, it should come out to 96.02. We're monitoring uh, line frequency, and we had one other function here, which was crest factor. 1.420, that's a peak divided by RMS. And uh, sine waves, what we had here, should be pretty close to square root of 2. Here's another measurement. Now I got some distortion, some chop on the current. The voltage is being flat topped a little bit. So my RMS voltage was 118.67, my RMS current, 0.6376. Power was measured at 7307 watts. We're still pretty much at a 60 hertz line frequency. The VAS, 75.67, that's the volts times the amps. Had a bar measurement. And here I had a total harmonic distortion calculation uh, on the current because of all this distorted waveform. So our watts is just the RMS voltage times the RMS current times the power factor. Volt amps, symbol S, RMS voltage times the RMS current. Now the total power can be calculated as looking at the DC component, that's uh, symbol or uh, subscript zero. So the DC voltage times the DC current, we get the DC power times the first order harmonic, that's what this is, first order voltage times the first order current times the cosine of the angle between voltage and current. So we look at each of the harmonic contents and we add those up. Or more precisely we can say that the total power is the sum of the DC component plus all the harmonic contents. Now we did a single phase two wire measurement with one watt meter. Now what do we do when it comes to a three phase three wire, three phase four wire, and other combinations? Well the Blondell transformation went into all the theory, uh, amplitude, vector analysis, and everything else. And it came up that total power is measured with one less watt meter than the number of wires. So like our single phase two wire meter application, we used one watt meter. If we had a single phase three wire, this would be maybe like some of the power in your home on electric uh, ranges, uh, dryers, we're going to use a two watt meter method. And our three phase three wire, which most of our motors are going to be, we're going to use a two watt meter method to measure total power. Then a three phase four wire, we're going to measure that with three watt meter method. So in our three phase three wire system, all we need to measure is two watt meters. So we got our load, a three phase three wire motor, we got three wires coming out of the motor, we just connect a watt meter into two of the leads. Again, follow the instructions in your user's manual as far as what, how to mount those, uh, how to measure the voltage and the current. And this example, it just shows the uh, watt meter in what we call maybe line A and voltage from A to B. But follow what's in your manual because that's the way the engineers designed it. But the total power is going to be the sum of two watt meters. We don't need this third one to measure total power. 
There's some advantages to this two watt meter system. Uh, it's a simple installation, simple wiring. It gives you accurate power measurement either on a balanced or an unbalanced system. So we're measuring power, two watt meter method. It's going to give us an accurate measure. It's a low cost installation because we don't need the additional uh, current or potential transformer. I say it's a good system for production testing. Your design is done, the motor is designed, uh, everything should be balanced in the motor. We're interested in maybe uh, just the power measurement under operating loads. So it's a good production testing system. Now, for you guys that are doing the engineering work, we need a little more information when we're designing the motor. So here, I like to uh, recommend that you know, this is the best method for our engineering and R&D work is to put three watt meters. Measure the current in each of the lines, measure each of the line to line voltages, and the two watt meter method is still used for total power. But we can get these other parameters by putting all three watt meters in the system. Let's look at the uh, power factor. We're taught usually power factors cosine of theta, cosine of the angle between voltage and current. And this is defined as the displacement power factor. Displacement, we're looking at the angle between voltage and current. And that's fine as long as you have a sine wave and you can get the relative zero crossing. But for all other waveforms, most of our application, we have some kind of distortion or something like that. We, don't, we can't get that uh, good uh, zero crossing. So power factor then becomes the total watts divided by the total VA. And this is true power factor. Works on any type of a waveform. So on our three-phase system, a three-phase four wire, Remember, total power is the sum of the three watt meters, and the total VA is the sum of the three VAs. On a three phase three wire system, where we use a two watt meter method, okay, total power then is just the sum of two watt meters. And we only got two meters in there, so it's going to be the sum of the two VAs times square root of three divided by two because it's a line to line measurement. What happens if the load is unbalanced? So we've got phase currents that are different. We could get some errors then because we don't have the third current measurement, the third VA. So with the three watt meter uh, method in our three phase three wire system. Now I've got total power, and it's the sum of two watt meters, and I look at all three of the VAs. This will give us an accurate power measurement, and it gives us an accurate, correct power factor, either on a balanced or an unbalanced, because I'm looking at all three of the VAs. And Yokogawa has a, a special wiring configuration they call the 3V3A, 3 voltage, 3 current wire method. So, with the 3 phase 3 wire system, use the 3V3A wire method. It'll give us a correct total power with the 2 watt meter method. It'll give us total power factor and VA measurements on either balanced or unbalanced wiring system. Now, let's look at some uh, mechanical measurements. In the electric motor, our mechanical power, very simple, speed times torque. Mechanical power. And it's typically defined as kilowatts or horsepower. And in the mechanical system, one watt is a joule per second or a newton meter per second. So with our mechanical power then, we can calculate that as 2 times pi times the rotating speed divided by 60 times the torque. 
and this is rotating speed in revolutions per minute RPM. Our torque is measured in Newton meters. This will give us the mechanical power in watts. Horsepower then is the work done per unit of time. And some conversions, one horsepower is 33,000 pound feet of work per minute. So we can calculate horsepower then as the RPM times the torque in pound feet divided by this constant of 5,252. And this has to do with our torque being measured in pound feet. Now you may have seen some conversion factors, uh, horsepower, uh, maybe one horsepower rounded off is 746 watts. Uh, if we go back and look at the actual conversion, one horsepower is 745.69987 watts. But a lot of times we round it off. Uh, one horsepower could be 745.7 or sometimes you see 746. But you got to remember the most accurate conversion is this with all the decimal points. So, let's look at an AC induction motor speed. Actual speed, the shaft rotation speed, typically measured, uh, it's typically measured with a tachometer. Uh, then we got the synchronous speed, that's the speed of the stator's uh, magnetic field rotation. And uh, this is the motor's theoretical speed since uh, the rotor will always turn at a slightly slower rate. So the synchronous speed is 120 times frequency divided by the number of poles in the motor. Then we have another function which we call slip. And this is the difference in speed of the rotor and I just called it RS, rotor speed, for this example, and the synchronous speed, or SS, for this example. So percent of slip, the difference in speed of the two, is the synchronous speed minus the rotor speed divided by the synchronous speed. Then efficiency, in the most simple form, is just output power divided by the input power. So the output power in the motor is going to be the mechanical power divided by the electrical input power. Let's look at some instrument selection now. We have uh, North American testing standards with the uh, IEEE 112, NAVLAP 150, CSA, they have theirs for Canada, uh, C390. And they specify the accuracy of the various instrumentation uh, to use in their testing standards to meet the requirements of their testing standards. And so like I, uh, IEEE 112, uh, the input power needs to be measured uh, within 0.2% uh, of full scale. Uh, voltage and current, again, 0.2% of full scale. So they define each one of these. CTs and PTs have an accuracy of 0.3% of full scale. That's the total ratio and phase error. Okay, so all of these are defined as to the type of instrumentation and the accuracy that's needed. Now CSA is interesting because they include uh, for the power reading uh, the CT and the PT errors. So the overall error is 0.5% uh, of reading. Current sensors, very important because most of the time we cannot uh, when we get into the bigger motors, we're going to have to step down that current to get it into the power analyzer so we can measure it. We have a lot of different current transformers that we can help you with. Uh, you know, the AEMC, nice uh, clamp arm type. Got to be careful though uh, with the accuracy. Uh, make sure you pick one that's going to meet the specifications. Uh, scope probes, uh, our Neoka Gauss scope probes, well, they're not going to meet those accuracy. Uh, specifications are they? Uh, typically those are in the 1 to 2 percent error. Uh, Yokogawa makes some of their own current transformers, uh, you know, very good, 0.2 percent, and these can go up to very high currents where you feed them through the window, or you can uh, connect lower currents up here at the top and then your output to the meter. This is a voltage transformer here. 
Uh, this Yokogawa LAM uh, CT system, very high accuracy. Uh, we've worked together with LAM to provide a complete system compatible with the power analyzer. Uh, this CT head, it's an active head. It does require a, a power supply signal conditioning unit and uh, hooks up then to the CT head and then we get a signal back out to the power analyzer. And this is just an example of how we might put the uh, uh, primary current leads through the CT window. Uh, Pearson Electronics, we see a lot of those in lighting industries, but uh, their accuracy is probably not quite going to fit. They're up in the 1% area. Uh, DC area will use uh, shunts and uh, RAM meter shunts. They have some very high accuracy shunts in the 0.1% area. And that's for DC only. Some selection considerations, of course. The first one is accuracy. Uh, and it's typically specified from the manufacturer as the CT turns ratio accuracy. The other one is phase shift. So one or two degrees maximum, cosine of two degrees, 0.9994. Will that meet your accuracy requirements? Well, uh, you gotta look at it and see it may or may not. Then of course we have to select the frequency range. Uh, if we're looking at uh, you know, DC um, or sine wave input, we can use a DC shunt. For AC and DC, uh, we can use what we call an active type or a, a CT with a Hall effect sensor in it. Uh, these usually uh, lose a lot of accuracy with that Hall sensor, so be careful. Regular instrument transformers, uh, like the Yokogawa, uh, very high accuracy. They typically operate from 30 hertz and higher. Then you got to determine, well, will the output meet the input to my power analyzer? There's different outputs, a millivolt per amp, a milliamp per amp, uh, or some of the CTs are just a 5 amp secondary. You have to be careful with the load and burden that you're putting on the CT. Scope probes, I said caution. We saw the accuracy on the scope probes. Uh, use them on the scope typically won't work on the app application for the power analyzers. Then, of course, you want to be, uh, be aware of the physical requirements, such as size. Uh, do I need a clamp on? Can I use a donut type? And again, the distance from the load to the instrument, the burden that you're putting on the CT. Now, here's a word of caution in red. Never open circuit the secondary side of a current transformer while it's energized. Uh, this can cause damage to the CT and uh, can even be harmful to the uh, equipment and the operators. Remember, a CT is a current source, so going back to Ohm's law, E equals IR. If R becomes very large, E becomes very high. And that internal voltage then uh, can cause a, a lot of damage to the CT. We can have a magnetic saturation internally. The windings can be damaged. Uh, it, can, it can actually destroy the CT. So be careful. Never open circuit the secondary side when it's energized. All right, let's look at the uh, electrical power measurements on a three-phase AC motor. There's our motor. We're going to put a load on it. I got a three phase coming into the motor and we're going to measure it with a power analyzer. A couple simple measurements. We measured the um, line to line voltage here, 120 on each one. Uh, the currents 415 milliamps, so we don't need a CT on this one. Current's low enough. We got our total power measured at 77.775 watts, and this motor had a, a 0.89912 uh, power factor, so it's pretty well loaded. Now, if we ever look at the waveforms now on our motor on a line-to-line -line hookup, have you ever done that? The line to line voltage, we'll see sine waves, but they're not 120 degrees apart. They're 60 degrees apart. This is what we call a delta connection. We'll show you a little bit more in a minute. 
Now the currents, okay, they're sideways and they're 120 degrees apart, balanced, real well. So in a three-phase, three-wire power measurement, typical motor measurement, we said we're going to use a two-watt meter method. So the sum, if we look at the um, sum of all these readings, and I did have a third meter in here just to show you as an example. So the total power is going to be the sum, in this case, the way the meter's uh, designed, of uh, power one plus power two of 22.978. That's going to be your total power, and that's what was measured, and that's what these two will add up. So we can see the uh, RMS voltage on each one, the currents on each load, and our VA and the VAR. Now you see we cannot measure phase power factor, it's lambda. We can get the total power factor, but we cannot get the phase power factor, because these are not phase measurements. So again, in the three-phase, three-wire power measurement, we've got our voltage waveforms connected line to line. Get nice sine waves, 60 degrees apart. And our phase currents, nice balanced, in this case, 120 degrees apart. Now this is what we talk about with our delta connection. We talk about the lines A, B, C. All right, so we got uh, each line A, B, and C. And if we make the connection line to line, we got voltage A to B, voltage B to C, and voltage A to C. And those connect. This is where the term delta comes in. All right, it forms a delta measurement. Now the red would be, if we had a neutral, would be line to neutral, but we don't have a neutral. And then the blue I've just drawn in for our uh, arbitrary current measurement someplace. So the voltages are 60 degrees apart, okay, it's a delta triangle, not 120, because the voltages are line to line. And the currents then are 120 degrees apart. So, what if you need to measure the phase power and the phase power factor on your three-phase, three-wire motor? Well, we'll give you a technique that will allow you to make these phase measurements on the three-phase, three-wire system. You have to be careful with this, but what we're going to do is create a floating neutral and make a four-wire system out of it. So, we've got our three phases hooked up to the load. We're going to put the watt meters, measure each current in series, and the voltages then, we're going to connect the, um, the high side then to each of the lines. And the low side, the plus minus, then we're going to tie those together. Okay, we're going to tie those together at the instrument. And this becomes what we call a floating neutral. And so we have a floating neutral. We can make a three-phase, four-wire measurement. But there's a caution. This will work without a problem on induction, synchronous motors, similar type motors, as long as you do not have a variable speed PWM drive. Uh, these drives uh, with the high frequency can cause uh, some inconsistent measurements. I think there might be some circulating harmonics or things like that. So as long as you have just a, a synchronous motor, sine wave input, it'll work just fine. So use this technique only on products with a sine wave type input. Now, here's another tip. Say I do have a PWM drive. You can turn on the line filter, which is typically a low pass filter. On the Yokogawa, it's typically a 500 hertz low pass filter. Uh, but turn on the lowest line filter that you have available to you. Then the readings that you'll see will be that of the fundamental frequency, not the total power. 
not the total R in this, not the total current, okay? Everything's going to be filtered. So, but you can read all the phase parameters at the fundamental. So here's our three phase, three wire voltage, 60 uh, degrees apart, line to line measurement. Here's our phase currents. Put in our floating neutral, and now I get a line to line, a line, excuse me, a line to neutral measurement. Just like a three phase, four wire system. The voltage now is 120 degrees apart, and the current is also 120 degrees apart. So let's look at the measurements. This is done with a six element uh, power analyzer. Uh, three of them were hooked up as a three phase, three wire measurement. Okay, 3B3A method actually, so we can see all three voltages and all three currents. And we can see the total power was measured at 40.87 watts. On the other three elements, we hooked up a three phase, we made it a three phase, four wire with a floating neutral. Uh, here the voltage 55.20, remember the voltage line to neutral times the square root of 3 equals the voltage line to line. So if we take the 55.2 times the square root of 3, we should get this 95.6 and everything is correct. So now we can see our line to the neutral calculations here on the motor. The currents you'll see are the same. All right, here's the currents hooked up three phase three wire. Here's the currents hooked up with the floating neutral. They're the same. And the power now comes out the same, 40.89, 40.87, basically the same. So the power measured in the three phase three wire will equal the power measured in the three phase four wire under these conditions. You'll see the power factor is also the same. And this is with the uh, PWM drive, we had the line uh, filter on and a floating neutral was created. So with our uh, three phase three wire and the three phase four wire delta measurements, again our line to line voltages compared to the line to neutral voltages. And then we can see some of the neutral current that might be flowing when we make this connection. Some of our power meters now have an actual delta measurement function. So we hook this up to begin with as a three phase three wire, 3V3A. Three three we're getting our uh, line to line uh, voltage measurements, 135 volts. We're getting each of the phase currents. And we're measuring with the three phase three wire method 20.49 watts. Now, with the delta measurement, this is actually going to calculate that line to neutral voltage for you. You don't have to create anything. It's all done internally. So we're going to calculate the 78 uh, volts line to neutral. And it's also going to calculate the phase power for you, the 6.8 watts per phase. If we add all three of these up, it comes up to 20.49 exactly. Exactly the same as what we measured with the three phase three wire connection. And these are our calculated values. <coughs> Real handy. You don't have to go back in there and try to connect anything, try to create floating neutrals or anything else. So, now we'll get into mechanical power measurements. Here's our motor. Take a three phase AC input. We're going to add in the speed and torque sensors and some type of load. And now we're going to use a power analyzer with what we call a motor function. The motor function now can bring in the speed and torque sensor signals. There's a lot of different speed and torque sensors available. Uh, various manufacturers such as Honeywell, Sensotec, uh, Lebo, uh, Himmelstein, Magtro, HBM, others 
a lot of different types, a lot of good ones available. They make various sizes, types for your different application. Uh, I said contact the sensor manufacturer for the right selection and application assistance. Use their expertise to help you out. We've worked with most of them, but uh, let them help you choose the right sensor. Just a few uh, of them, uh, Himmelstein is an example, uh, Hoffman Estates, Illinois. Uh, they have a digital a torque meter, a couple different types available. They make uh, their own mechanical power uh, measurement, signal conditioning, and, and, and readout. So they make the electronics to go along with that. There's one from uh, Honeywell. A lot of different sensors available, uh, speed and torque. And again, they make a signal conditioning unit also to go with their matched sensors. Magtrol, they make a real nice dynamometer controller, controls their inline uh, speed and torque sensors. They also make a, a lot of uh, test benches, which is handy uh, to get started uh, so you can mount your motors, uh, speed, and uh, speed and torque sensors, uh, the brake back here. So they do make some test benches that are pretty handy to get started. So let's look at some mechanical measurements. And this is what I call system number one. We put a speed sensor in and we put a torque sensor in. We use the sensor manufacturer's measuring instrument. It's matched, okay, and it's going to give us a proper output. And this output then can go to a, a PC, computer, and used with application software. So the key thing here is it's a simple system. Uh, we use the sensor manufacturer's measuring system. This is a uh, picture of a Magtrol system with their controller, with their test stand, with their speed and torque sensor. Uh, they had the brake down here which could be controlled uh, you know, through the dynamometer here. And uh, we had a, a motor and a drive system back here. This was originally from uh, Novatorque. It was uh, one of their test fixture systems. So the advantages of uh, system number one, uh, it's a matched system with the sensors. You use a manufacturer sensor, everything is matched. It provides the proper signal conditioning. We get a readout of torque, speed, and mechanical power. A lot of these do have a communications output, RS-232 or GPIB, uh, maybe USB now, and uh, analog output signals sometimes for other readout instruments. A lot of times they do have their own application software. But again, I say contact the sensor manufacturer for the selection and their application assistance. Now here's what I call system number two. We use the speed and torque sensor again. We use the sensor manufacturer's signal conditioning. Out of the signal conditioner, we get a, a signal, speed signal, and a torque signal. And we can run these into a special power analyzer that has a speed and torque input. And this is usually referred to as the motor option on our power, uh, the Okagawa power analyzers. Then from the power analyzers, we can hook it up to a, a PC and use uh, available application software. So again, we're using the power analyzer for the mechanical power measurement now. Some of the advantages, again, it's a match system, you know, to the sensors, provides a proper signal conditioning, we can get a pulse or an analog signal output, and conditions the speed and torque signals provided for the power analyzers. So the power analyzer now calculates the electrical and mechanical power parameters. The important thing here is both electrical and mechanical measurements are made simultaneously. Okay, there's no time skew. And we can make the efficiency calculations. And then we can use either custom or generic application software that may be available. Here's an example of the setup menu inside the power analyzer for the motor setup. 
uh, we can set up our pulse uh, input, uh, pulses per revolution uh, with our sync speed, uh, some of the other scaling functions. All of that's real easy to set up internally in the power analyzer. So our speed and torque measurements now uh, can be made directly on the power analyzer. Uh, speed here at 3600 RPM and the torque at uh, 5.26 uh, Newton meters. So everything's made correctly for you. Now let's look at some uh, PWM pulse width modulated drive measurements uh, on our AC motor. So we got our motor, we're going to put an inverter drive in, in front of it so we can uh, bring in the uh, D, uh, a DC signal, a single phase or a three phase input. These inverters have, you know, can bring in a lot of different primary power and then they can give you the three phase output power that your motor needs and then tie it in with the load. And this is tied in with a WT1800E six-phase power analyzer, so we can see all of this, uh, you know, six measurements. Here's a uh, little trainer uh, that we have. Uh, this has a single-phase input and then a three-phase output to this motor. And we use this uh, a lot for some of our, our training and a lot of these slides that you'll see. Uh, this is the PWM voltage. It's a, a chopped up, uh, you know, square wave. Uh, so it's a pulse width modulated voltage. See a few little spikes on it, and then there's a lot of switching noise that's carried over to the current side. So some of the uh, issues with our uh, PWM drive, uh, it's a high frequency switching on the voltage signal. The uh, voltage driving waveform is uh, very distorted. You have very high voltage harmonic content. And the frequency can be varied from zero hertz on up to whatever the drive, up into the kilohertz area. Then the uh, uh, current signal, it also has a, a high noise level, comes from the voltage side, and it also has a variable frequency again from zero hertz on up. And it's a distorted waveform, but uh, it's a lower level harmonic content. So we need a high accuracy power measurement with a wide bandwidth power analyzer to make these measurements. Now here's what we're talking about as an example of the harmonic content on the voltage. And this is out to about 30 kilohertz if you look at these beat frequencies we have on our NAP. If we look at the uh, current side, uh, most of the harmonic is uh, lower level, uh, right down here towards the uh, uh, fundamental area and a lower frequency, but you do see we do have a, a spike that's significant every once in a while. So, with the inverter voltage, typically it's uh, measured a couple different ways. We can measure it, you know, with our true RMS measurement. And we said, you know, RMS is going to include all the harmonic content up to the bandwidth of the instrument. Or we can look at the amplitude of the fundamental wave only. And this is what contributes to the motor torque, that fundamental voltage waveform. And again, the thing we have to be aware of is the variable frequency uh, of the fundamental that varies from zero hertz on the way up to the limits of, of that drive. Now the current is a little bit different. It's only measured one way. And we make a true RMS measurement of the current. Because the uh, harmonic content uh, is what has to do with the uh, currents and is responsible for the temperature rise, rise in the motor. So how do we measure this amplitude uh, of the fundamental wave? Well, one of the things we can do is put a low-pass filter in there. And that'll give us a RMS voltage of the fundamental, as long as we've got the right to, you know, filter applied. So the filter must be available to match the fundamental frequency. But it's also going to filter the current and the power measurements. 
not only going to uh, filter the voltage so we can look at the fundamental voltage, but it's going to filter everything. So filtering typically is not a desirable method. So what else can we do? Well, we can use this rectified mean measurement method. Remember, this will give us an RMS voltage of the fundamental without filtering. Uses a mean voltage uh, detection scaled to RMS. That's where we had uh, uh, we make a mean value and scale it to RMS with that 1.11 multiplier. And we're going to show you these measurements made simultaneously. And this has been an accepted method for many, many years. So here, with our average responding meter to get the RMS value. It has a 1.11 multiplier on it to get RMS. So how do we measure the amplitude of the fundamental? We can use the uh, uh, harmonic analysis function. Use the FFT, the fast wave transform, to determine the amplitude of each of the harmonics. This will give us an accurate RMS voltage measurement of the fundamental wave. And a lot of our new power analyzers now uh, can make RMS and uh, regular normal measurements simultaneously with the harmonic measurements. So let's look at the comparison between the uh, different measurement modes. This one is the RMS voltage, okay? No filters, just a true RMS measurement of that PWM is 219 volts. This is the mean voltage measurement. It was a math function. Okay, that's why the F2. All right, this is the mean scale to RMS, 194. This is the filtered method. Okay, so we put a low-pass filter on it. We got 194, just about the same, aren't they? A little bit different, 0.3 volts difference. And then this is the harmonic analysis function on the fundamental. Okay, so this gives us the fundamental of 193.8. A little bit different. This might be the best way to do it, the most accurate. But you can see all of them are very close. So with our uh, PWM motor, uh, with uh, using the 3V3A measurement method, drive voltage, we typically use the mean voltage measurement. Here we had 113.064. Okay. And then the uh, DC bus voltage uh, could be measured uh, with the uh, peak uh, voltage measurement function, the or U peak one three hundred thirty four. So looking at the uh, motor drive efficiency, uh, you know, it's calculated as the output power divided by the input power, and typically expressed as a percentage. So how do we do it? We can measure the input and output power with two power meters and then calculate the efficiency from the two readings. The problem here is we've got two readings that may be made a little bit differently in time so we could have a time skew error. The best way is to measure input and output power with a, what we call a multi-element power analyzer like uh, one of the uh, six element uh, meters that we showed you so we can calculate three phase in, three phase out uh, and calculate the efficiency uh, in a single power analyzer and eliminates any time skew. We have uh, you know, set up formulas, uh, screens within the uh, power analyzers where we can set up these efficiency uh, calculations and uh, here we've got the uh, uh, total power, this would be like uh, power output divided by maybe a single phase input power. So the power analyzers have a lot of setup menus to help you with that setup. Some other things that uh, we may need to look at are the drive power loss, um, besides the efficiency. Uh, and several of our power, our power analyzers have a math function that we can do uh, to write some of these formulas. And power loss is just going to be your input power minus your output power. So here's some of the measurements 
Uh, we had the uh, input power of 54.97 and the output power of 30.803 uh, measured with the power analyzer. So now we can look at the drive efficiency. Okay, I put uh, the input and the uh, input drive the output and then the drive loss of 24. Another measurement on our uh, drives is the uh, volts per hertz. A lot of our drives uh, should maintain a constant volts per hertz ratio in the motor. So we've got to make sure that that is maintained over the speed range of the drive. Now we can calculate the volts per hertz using the RMS or the fundamental voltage, just as long as it's a constant even ratio all the way through the speed range. And here we can use this math function again in the power analyzer. So if we use the RMS voltage function with our uh, math function, so it's uh, voltage uh, E1 element 1 order T total. Okay, so that's the true RMS divided by the frequency, volts per hertz. Or if we look at the fundamental, now we can look at the voltage on element number one and order one. So we're using the harmonics and just getting the order one and then divide by the frequency. So our volts per hertz measurement, this is the RMS volts per hertz at 8.759. If we use the fundamental, it's a different value, 4.189. But again, you want to look at a constant volts per hertz over that speed range. DC bus uh, voltage measurement uh, should be checked for the overall uh, over and under voltage conditions. Now you can get inside the drive and try to get on the capacitance bank and uh, measure it there. If that's not accessible, uh, we can use the power analyzer, use the uh, voltage uh, display and a cursor measurement to try to get that. So here's our PWM, and if you look very carefully at the circle, there's a white cursor, okay, it's a, a crosshair, and I got it laid right on top. I don't want to get up here in this spike, I want to get it right down flat, all right? So we can measure that DC best voltage. And in this case, it was measured as uh, 302.81 volts. Some of the uh, setup things with the Yokogawa power uh, analyzers for PWM measurements, uh, setup mode, uh, depending on what type of power analyzer you have on the uh, WT1800, PX8000, we use what we call the normal mode. With the WT3000E, we use what is designed a little bit different, so we use the RMS mode. Wiring configuration, I recommend the 3V3A. Filters, uh, be careful with this. Uh, line filters, we showed you how to use them, but generally you want that line filter off. The zero cross filter, this is a frequency filter, very important. Turn that on so you can make proper fundamental frequency measurement. And then to do the uh, fundamental voltage measurement uh, with the WT3000E, WT1800E, PX8000, uh, use that with the normal harmonics. Uh, U for voltage and then order one. So here's our overall power PWM drive measurement example. Uh, this is the average of the three voltages, 192. We can see each of the phase currents. Uh, this is the uh, fundamental, it's U11, order one, so fundamental voltage. And we've got a total power factor and uh, total power and our frequency. Let's look at the total system now. This is a, uh, a custom uh, dyno system. It was uh, built by uh, Automation Engineering up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, there's the motor under test. 
and uh, all the uh, other mechanical measurement functions, the load and everything back here. Got all your power uh, su uh, supply systems for the motors and your instrumentation. Uh, there's a local gallon power analyzer back here. So pretty elaborate uh, custom motor test stand. With a motor test system, there's a three-step measurement process. So we look at the input to the inverter, the output of the inverter to the motor, we look at the mechanical power with speed and torque sensors, and then we've got a variable load out here. This is measured with a six-phase uh, power analyzer. So in this example, we've got a three-phase in and a three-phase out, so we can look at everything simultaneously. So with our total system, with a variable speed drive, we look at the input and output power, calculate the drive efficiency and power loss, and we can look at some of the other uh, drive performance functions. We have an uh, accurate measurement of the motor input power. So we can measure that total electrical uh, power to the motor, and uh, we can look at the kilowatts of horsepower, the power factor. Look at the uh, mechanical power measurements, motor speed and torque, calculate the mechanical power, develop speed and torque force. I know we recommend using the power analyzer for all electrical and mechanical power measurements. All measurements will be made simultaneously. There's no time skew, no error. We have accurate efficiency calculations, and we can provide a, a software solution. So with our motor test system, again, some of the internal uh, setup functions, uh, where we can look at the drive efficiency, the total system efficiency, and uh, what we call uh, method A, motor efficiency. So IEEE standard 112 is probably the most common uh, testing standard here in the U.S. for uh, testing motors. So it defines the parameters such as uh, uh, temperature, resistance, uh, losses, standard losses, rotor losses, efficiency test methods. Uh, when I looked at uh, it was 11 different test methods are outlined in IEEE 112. So a lot of different ways of uh, making these calculations. The efficiency uh, under method A is a simple input-output calculation. Output power divided by input power. Or mechanical power divided by the electrical input power. That's simple method A. Now, method B gets to be very complex because it not only looks at the uh, uh, you know, input-output, but it looks at a lot of other losses internally in the motor. Uh, load losses, friction, uh, windage, uh, core loss, uh, I squared R stator, I squared R rotor losses, and uh, takes a lot of additional instrumentation to measure all of these additional loads. And IEEE 112 says use those, our motors, uh, from 1 to 300 kilowatts. So with all these different methods, uh, which one should I use? Well, uh, for the, if you're making motors, electrical motor manufacturers, uh, you could use uh, method A or method B. Uh, usually method B, uh, if you have all the instrumentation to do it, uh, otherwise use method A. And the efficiency calculations may be different depending on which method you use. And the differences can also be because of the differences in loads and motor speeds and some of the other test conditions. Electrical system accuracy, uh, what we need to do and this is, I guess, to be very complex, and uh, if you need help, we can help you with that. But we take 
the accuracy of the different power meters here. We've looked at, uh, you know, three, four of our different power analyzers, taking those accuracy specifications, come down with a watt uncertainty. These are from the specifications in the manual. Calculate a wattage percent of reading, okay? And here's your wattage uh, percent reading, and you just calculate uh, percent of reading. Got to get everything in the same units. And then the CT, if we're using CTs, uh, we take the CT accuracy, okay, and convert that into a percent of reading also. And so this CT was a 0.02 percent of full scale, and I calculated that into a percent of reading. From these two functions, uh, the percent of reading, I take this, this and calculate those uh, errors as a square root of the sum of the squares, and I come up with this final value. Now the CT reading uncertainty is the CT accuracy times the range, okay, divided by the current reading. And so the square root of the sum of the squares, and then that's times two, this is in a two watt meter method, plus the watt uncertainty. And so this gives us the total system uncertainty. So in conclusion, I got something good coming up for you, so stay, stay, uh, stay with us. Hopefully we've provided you with a, a three-step process for a complete electrical test of your AC motor and a variable speed drive. Looking at the input to the inverter, the output, motor load, mechanical power, and this is the variable load. We've reviewed some of the basic electrical power measurements and mechanical power measurements. Looked at instrument considerations, which is very important in meeting these different standards as well as the current sensors. Gave a couple different uh, examples uh, with the step one with the three phase AC motor, and then the mechanical power measurement with the speed and torque, and then the uh, motor efficiency calculations. Then we look at the PWM motor drive, input and output drive power and loss efficiency, other typical drive measurements, uh, our motor and drive systems uh, all put together, and look at the total system, did a quick review of IEEE standard 112. Hopefully we've answered your questions as we go along. Now Yokogawa offers uh, the most complete line of power analyzers to meet your application and your budget. We have people here to support you. Uh, we have product, application, and software support provided from our network of uh, field sales reps, our factory regional sales managers, and our factory support application engineers all here in Noonan, Georgia. We give you a guaranteed measurement accuracy over the bandwidth of the instrument. We have available NIST traceable calibrations and ISO 17025 calibration all provided here out of the Noonan, Georgia facility. And all the Yokogawa power analyzers come with a three-year warranty. So just a few of our power analyzers, a few of our scopes with power analysis. And we have a lot of webinars besides, uh, you know, the, uh, the power. So join us for these uh, future webinars. Uh, you can get those online if you go to tmi.yokogawa.com and look at our technical library. Some of the webinars that we've had, we've had basic power measurements, harmonic analysis like the motor analysis today. Uh, we have a lot of scope, uh, oscilloscope, a scope quarter applications. And so keep in touch with these educational webinars. All right, now here's something. Here's, here's some fun. Fun with motors. Take this and have some fun with it. Count the number of electric motors in your house. All right, here's some tips. Look at your kitchen appliances, okay? Your refrigerator, your stoves, your microwaves. Look at the uh, HVA system in your house, the air conditioning and uh, furnace. Look at the home entertainment system, okay? Home office, your computers, disk drives, printers, scanners, uh, lawn equipment. You have electric lawn equipment, and look at the you know other things that are using 
electric motors, you'd be surprised how many motors who will show up in your house. So have some fun with it. You can make it a, a family project, or, you know, work together, or you can make it a family competition, all right? The guys versus the girls, or whatever. <laughs> so have some fun with it, and uh, enjoy it. So thank you for attending, and if you have questions, let us know. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, Bill, for that presentation. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. I know we went a little bit over the one hour, so we will answer your questions. I know specifically, I think, Stacy, I saw you, you submitted a couple questions. So we will be emailing all those answers for you. Also, here is our contact information, tmi.yokogawa.com. You can also email webinars at us.yokogawa.com.